for your learners welcome to today's session so i mean today your teacher is changed so today might be you know very well to ma'am because already he has taken your class msou2 so now dr tanav mahanti is present is really a good i mean very good counselor i mean she is teaching in bani bihar she is i mean assistant professor in bani bihar so i mean i requested her she is not interested she is busy with very busy with other work but she accepted my invitation so for you so i do feel i mean i do feel that class was not so interesting in my point of view so i am not going with that so with this i mean due to this pandemic you all are stuck down in the home i mean no doubt it is a very critical juncture it's a very critical time because now this month of june is very very vital so i just so want to stay home stay safe so i do feel definitely will enjoy with the ma'am's class so now ma'am is teaching little in odia also ma'am is not comfortable odia but still she is trying to teach in odia also so i with these words i welcome you ma'am for this session so i don't waste much time so i now i welcome to ma'am ma'am may we have a meeting so i don't know i will join in last or not if you will, if you will not join you will, you will conclude the session okay, with sir. words once again i welcome you ma'am thank you ma'am so i just hand over the session to you ma'am thank you sir thank you uh, good afternoon learners uh, as i was told that uh, you have already completed 12 units from sociology of religion and i will be starting the 13th one so uh, that said we would begin uh, we have uh, in today's session we have two theories one is clifford griggs and the other is um, levi strauss and then we will move into some of the case studies of certain uh, religious forms so we'll be talking about the sikh community and if time permits maybe we'll take up some other community so let's see how we go about it uh, i just have prepared one slide uh, for the session i just want you to have a look uh, let me just just give me a moment yes so it is about uh, i believe you can see the slides each one of you you can see the slides slide ta disuchi ki nahi kya jana kon dio no response so i believe you should be she should be able to see the slide okay i'll just uh, start uh, well uh, talking about uh, clifford gates uh, clifford gates uh, i don't know you have uh, uh, heard him earlier or not but he is uh, one of the finest anthropologist who actually you know talked about uh, we mostly say that he is a symbolic anthropologist apna mane jodi dekhibe tikke jodi mane if you i don't know previous classes re uh, what uh, uh, how you have uh, approached this entire uh, topic but i just want to give you a brief uh, intro into you know various uh, uh, perspectives of looking at things or doing research before i you know start talking about clifford gates uh, if you look at uh, the initial pages of sociology we had a what you can say an uh, obsession for positivist methods odia re bhi kahunche jetara ame we started off with our classical thinkers be it august comte want to apan ko imail do kim want to kimba you know the the so called four fathers they had uh, they, the tilt was slightly towards positivist methods positivist methods re kono na usually ame natural sciences re se mane jo prakar method sabu apply karuthile ame sei prakar method chesta kolu social science re pura copy paste kori ki jemti ki even if you know it's not copy paste but we can you know follow the same principles the same guideline so that we can study societies so basically what we were trying to see is we were trying to you know take up the methods and the strategies that natural sciences was using so that we can discover our own laws kalki kon predict kare ami chahibu 
सोशल साइंसेस रे भी हमें लॉज तैयार कर दे पारु जेंते हमरो किछटा नेचुरल साइंसेस रे लॉज अछि सपोज न्यूटोनियन लॉ कहबो कि जे ऊपर को जोटा जीवो सेटा तळबो को यो यू हैव द फोर्स ऑफ ग्रेविटी देन एवरी एक्शन हैज अ इक्वल रिएक्शन एम दे जेंते किछ नेचुरल साइंसेस रे लॉज अछि हमें चेष्टा करथु सोशल साइंसेस रे किछ सेंते लॉज डिस्कवर करिया पे एंड वी हैड एज आई टोल्ड यू एन ऑब्सेशन फॉर दिस पॉजिटिव स्पेक्टर्स बट यू नो दे वे थिंकर्स लाइक वेबर कार्ल मैनहेम एंटी किचटा थिंकर्स थिले जो माने को लागे लागे जे कम ऑन वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट ह्यूमन सोसाइटीज आमे मनीषा को विषय रे कथा कहू जो ए माने दीज आर नॉट ऑब्जेक्ट्स ऑब्जेक्ट माने गोटे सिचुएशन को रिएक्ट करबे दे विल रिएक्ट टू अ स्टिमुली बट एज ह्यूमन बीइंग्स यू नो वी बिहेव इन अ पर्टिकुलर सिचुएशन वी डोंट रिएक्ट एंड देयर आर सो मेनी थिंग्स इनटू इट फॉर इंस्टेंस यू नो सपोज मु कहबी जे गोटे कोटे ऑब्जेक्ट के कोटे सपोज ए देयर इज अ पेपर वेट ऑन माय टेबल राइट नाउ मु कहबी ए पेपर वेट टा को मु जदि एत्ती की डिग्री रे एत्ती की स्पीड रे फोपाडी बी इट विल एंड अप एट अ पर्टिकुलर डिस्टेंस एवरी टाइम आई डू इट आई विल फाइंड द सेम रिजल्ट बट इन केस ऑफ ह्यूमन बीइंग्स कैन वी प्रेडिक्ट सच अ थिंग मु कहबी डेली मु आपन को धक्का मारी मे बी यू नो यू विल फॉल एट अ पर्टिकुलर डिस्टेंस फॉर फॉर अ डे और टू नेक्स्ट थर्ड डे यू विल गिव मी अ पुस कि मुंडो खराब हे गेला नै मते एंती कोन थेला मारचंती एंती कोन करचंती सो एज ह्यूमन बीइंग्स वी कैन नॉट सिंपली बी कंपेयर्ड टू द यू नो टू नेचुरल ऑब्जेक्ट्स और टू आर्टिफिशियल ऑब्जेक्ट्स एंड द वे दे बिहेव वी हैव अ डिफरेंट वे ऑफ डूइंग इट सो दैट वाज यू नो द वेरी एसेंस ऑफ गिट्स अंडरस्टैंडिंग एंड हिज मेथड्स ही यू नो एट द क्रक्स ऑफ इट ही वाज ग्रेटली इन्फ्लुएंस्ड बाय वेबरियन इंटरप्रेटिव अंडरस्टैंडिंग Marx Weber unlike the you know other positivist uh, trending uh, sociologists like Comte or Durkheim Weber believed that as human beings you know we we actually we have this ability to step into somebody else's shoes mo suppose dekhi bhi je aaj aaj tumhe mo ta kai sikhe jo mo bhai bhi acha aaj kon hai thi bata sange और एमती किछ कोटे के कहि देला कि कोन असुविधा हैला कि आई विल ऑलवेज ट्राई टू पुट माय सेल्फ इन योर पोजीशन तम स्थान रे निजे को रखि कि मु देखि हम चेष्टा करबि जे कोन हे जे सो ग्रिट्स वाज यू नो वाज ट्राइंग टू टेक अप दोस अप्रोच जोटा कि हमें इंटरप्रेटिव अप्रोच कहथि व्हिच वाज बोरोड फ्रॉम वेबर्स इंटरप्रेटिव सोशियोलॉजी फर्स्ट हैन अप्रोच जोटा से कहथले जे कोन ना एज अ एज अ रिसर्चर you need not observe things like an observer but outsider he can observe kari be there is a perspective how do i look at things what actors perspective achi aur what observers perspective achi so se jo actor ta se situation re je really se situation re padi chi se kemti feel korchi se kemti dekhu chi i will try to look into those things so that was you know that was one of the initial inspirations of gids and uh, he used the same approach to study social system social change how power distribution takes place in a society so basically he was taking the help of this interpretive approach and that was the reason why we said that he was a symbolic anthropologist basically and as i told you he used the same uh, approach to study culture and basically you know his entire engagement was uh, into cultural studies and uh, being an anthropologist he was trying to look into the cultures of different societies and uh, he actually found one thing problematic that was the term culture and the way it was defined uh, i don't know you know if you take up any standard textbook is definition of this term culture which and one of the famous definition was uh, given by i think eb tyler tyler uh, तो मो टेक्स्ट रे एडा को नाही आई एम जस्ट यू नो ट्राइंग टू सपोर्ट इट विथ सम एक्जिस्टिंग यू नो फ्रेमवर्क सो दैट इट विल हेल्प यू इन अंडरस्टैंडिंग दिस थिंग इफ इफ यू लुक एट टाइलर्स डेफिनेशन टाइलर ऑलमोस्ट इंक्लूडेड एवरीथिंग अंडर दिस सन दैट वाज मैन मेड और दैट वाज यू नो दैट वाज क्रिएटेड बाय ह्यूमन बीइंग्स एज कल्चर सो ही फाउंड दैट कल्चर इज अ अम्ब्रेला टर्म no doubt because everything comes under this umbrella of culture because he decided uh, you know if, if you look at ab tyler's definition he defined culture as the sum total of beliefs values uh, 
architects, uh, artifacts, uh, material things, non-material things, everything. माने उटे मो belief system जहाँ मो वो values रे विश्वास रखो जी, ए table टा, chair टा, computer टा, everything is a part of culture. So when you have so many things categorized under one group, there lies the problem according to Gates. Gates कोई लेकिन Gates too vague. एमती हो जाए तो एक विराट बड़ा अम्ब्रेला टर्म नहीं कि हमें चेस्टा करीबो बुझिया को इट विल बी एनालिटिकली ना टू वीक इट्स नॉट गोइंग टू हेल्प अस एंड दैट वाज द रीजन यू नो फॉर हिम कल्चर वाज समथिंग यू नो ही स्टार्टेड यू नो ही सेड दैट लेट मी फर्स्ट ट्राई टू अराइव एट अ डेफिनेशन फॉर कल्चर बिकॉज ए जो डेफिनेशन ता जो एग्जिस्टिंग डेफिनेशन ता कल्चर रो अछि याकू ने कि uh, I cannot, uh, you know, make a strong argument when it comes to analysis of certain things. And for him, he started defining uh, that uh, culture denotes a historically transmitted pattern of meanings embodied in symbols, a system of inherited concepts expressed in symbolic forms by means of which men communicate. perpetuate and develop their knowledge and attitude towards uh, what you say life and uh, you would see that uh, you know when he is trying to make this kind of a definition his definition is uh, basically about uh, you know certain symbolic forms by which you know we are trying to communicate at the same time we are accumulating certain knowledge so basically it's a system of symbols symbols again it plays a very important role in uh, what you say in one's uh, life and uh, if you look at uh, gates analysis of religion he starts uh, you know he starts with uh, durkheim's conception of the sacred and the profane i i i think you might have been uh, taught durkheim durkheim apan man ko padhai sathibo and somewhere durkheim is actually using uh, this concept of uh, sacred and profane sacred ko ta profane ko na anything you know that comes under the purview of religion that's a sacred thing and anything apart from that is profane for example mo apan ko example debe gote pathar de gote pathar de suppose rasta re padi chi you might uh, you know kick it as a football tame ball bhaya ta goitha mari mari chaluthibo see same pathar ta ku taro din jane ani gote sindura tipa lage ki gote gachh tale thoi dabo that becomes a sacred thing ta purbo se ta profane thila ki for example tame gote thakuram kara photo kini ki anlo bazar jete bolan to bazar re thila tame bag re pure ki anlo tame pariya ba sange ta ku bi pokai ki anlo it was You know, it belonged to the category of profane. So the sacred hai ki nathla. In the moment you established it uh, in your puja, or tam jayi thakura bhare tamer rakhi ki puja aar ho kar dilo. So the sacred ho connotation paigal. So that is how you know Durkheim is trying to make uh, uh, you know a distinction between the sacred and the profane. And uh, if you uh, look at uh, you know the idea of sacred, it is represented by certain symbols then jaha bhi hame religion katha hame jette bale bhi kahu religion ta sab bale kichhi ta symbols dwara hi you know it is expressed and uh, mostly if you talk about religion religion is something that aligns human action to the cosmic order so if you talk about human beings human beings out of their collective imagination they have created a cosmic order that is sacred we tend to you know fall back upon that cosmic order again and again suppose koi bhi there are certain answers in life that we seek for kahin ki banchi chi wo life ra purpose kon ha sakale uthi ki khau chi piu chi sou chi but is that why i was born for kahin ki mu janma nahi chi i have certain you know questions like this and uh, Which is uh, associated with a certain apparent meaninglessness of life, which may bother people, and uh, you know we tend to find answers. Ya answer a kahi dey pari bani. Suppose jadi koi kotha na ko mark ko chare bhi, je ko kahi ki banchi chhi. Mark ko chare par thay chhu piyuchhu banchi chhu to asubhada kono hai par. So is that the answer to it? 
I will always try to find the answer. And uh, you know, if you talk it uh, from a very rationalist perspective, people will find it very absurd. But from a religious perspective, only religious, uh, you know, certain religious, uh, what do you say, framework can give a particular answer to these kind of questions. So, and in the life, in the bohut meaninglessness of life, ki, ki the absurdity of life, ki, we are faced with many problems which bother people and they need answers to that. And this is where these religious symbols they come out in, you know, trying to bridge this gap between reality or the cosmic order to that we believe that there is a cosmic order, there is a divine justice. We have to follow it. 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 I will be recognized. I will be recognized. So, you know, in the very process, uh, Gates was uh, trying to define religion. And uh, in his uh, definition, he says that uh, religion is nothing but a system of symbols. What is a system of symbols? The moment you enter a temple or, you know, you enter any religious uh, site, be it a church, be it, be it a you know, mosque, you will see that it is surrounded with certain symbols. Christianity, the moments you, you know, the idols, the object, the kind of, you know, environment it is created there. Everything is symbolic, everything has certain meaning. And secondly, he says that, it says that this system of symbol it actually acts to establish certain powerful, pervasive, and long lasting moods and motivations in people. And uh, he says, what he is trying to say is that you know, it's, it's, it's something that will motivate you, that will create a certain kind of mood in you. I need to visit the temple. Why do I need this? Because uh, he says that you know, it is important for establishing these uh, particular kind of moods and motivations and at the same time formulating certain concepts of a general order of existence. There is an order of existence and uh, you know how do I look at this entire thing and at the same time you know, it has certain uh, factuality associated with it and uh, everything, everything, the moods and motivation that it creates, everything seems so realistic when, you know, whenever I'm talking about religion. And uh, he, you know, makes an attempt, he is making an attempt to examine the meaning of religious symbols. So, uh, for him, culture is a system of symbol and religion is, you know, it's, it being an important part of culture is also symbolic. And that's why Gid says that there is a difference between religious symbols that is sacred and other realms of life. Anything that is associated with religion, it becomes sacred. That woman, sacred body And anything apart from that is profane. profane. So the division between the sacred and the profane, uh, it exists. And at the same time, you will see that uh, it actually elicits uh, multiple meaning. And whenever we talk about these religious symbols, it has a vehicle of conception. And, you know, it's, 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 like, a, it's like a vehicle. It can, you know, it can uh, be used uh, as an object, as an act, an event or equality, or it can represent an idea. But a symbol is a good power religion. But just for a religious symbol, it can take me to a different state of mind. And he believes that religion is a system of symbols. Religion is a system of symbol woven into an ordered whole. So the symbol is orderly related and it is uncritically accepted in every society. Society, religion, symbol, and those symbols are actually important 
in creating a coherent ordered world for human beings. Okay, we just see that kids uh, here is uh, giving an example from Japanese society. So Japanese society is a study book today, and he found that. Uh, those who do not prescribe to these religious norms are considered to be non-Japanese. It is tanko pe non-Japanese mane human life tendencies mane. Mane otti chhota chhuaara behavior ta non-Japanese se mane koi be. Because se chhota kiche jaane kamne. Ki jaane jaro te morality na hai, jaane kote culprit, jaane kote criminal. Samjhe loko kuchhi se mane non-Japanese koi be. Chhota kuchh har abhi se mane non-human life qualities dekhi be because. Those things, those people who do not uh, prescribe to the religious norms of their existing society, that was a non-Javanese poly, and uh, it had, uh, put a example they chanty gets it's there in your reading material. He says that put a Javanese mystic who is actually staring into the flame of the lamp, lamp or flame that can be on age. अब बहुत समय थी आमर रिलिजन रे भी था ना तो मैं इनके फ्लेम कोटे ऑनली कि तो मैं मेडिटेट करें या कुछ इस टाइप का रहूं कि कोटे पर्टिकुलर पॉइंट को देखिए यू ट्राई टू मेडिटेट सो बेसिकली यू नो द रीजन बिहाइंड इस दैट इट इंस्टिल्स ए सर्टेन व्हाट यू से ए सर्टेन काइंड ऑफ सेल्फ डिसिप्लि� and uh, it tries to you know control your emotions suppose bahut kanga lagu chi bahut rago lagu chi ame kuha jaye chi chatu to emotions ko control kar you don't have any control over your emotions and uh, if you try doing you know you try to meditate ame meditate kara dekhi bo it will be very helpful to you and what your meditation mane it's like you know it's like venting uh, out you are like controlling your emotions sei jo atyadhik raga lagutla mate gote point re lagutla ki jana ko piti pakai bi ki mu emiti kanda lagutla i was not able to control that because those movements are actually you know influential in uh, what you say influential in uh, uh, you know giving a particular controlled emotional expression and that's one of the major uh, functions of religion and uh, you know he has also you know given another example when he says that tama mana bahut kharab ho cha tame pura helplessly kandu chu tame tame kandu cha tame you need some space of privacy and uh, at that time you know you try to you know identify with uh, your god see ke bhi he par it could be an idol but a murti he par or photo he par कि मन मन तुम स्मरण करो आज तुमको लगे कि सब रास्ता बंद हो सारी कि अच्छा भगवान आसवे कि किए मत गोटे डिलेमु बाहर करेंगे मत उद्धार करेंगे सो यू नो इट्स इट्स इंस्टेड अच्छी हाँ डिवैन रियालीटी अच्छी somebody will be you know taking me out of this position and uh, life will be better after that you know uh, you would hear see that uh, symbols play a very important uh, role in uh, you know creating certain moods and motivations in us uh, there is a difference uh, between mood and motivation what git has said हमें मूड का तो कोई बात हुआ हमें मोटिवेशन का तो कोई बात हुआ। If you see that uh, no mood is uh, actually uh, a kind of uh, what you say it's a kind of uh, uh, state of mind. Uh, I don't know uh, if you look at uh, reading material तो हम अपने मटेरियल पे सुटे एग्जांपल दे चाहिए जो मूड इज actually a scalar entity and motivation is a vector entity uh, school level physics re padhai thi bo jemte ki you know uh, uh, i don't want to go into those details but uh, you know if you will see uh, uh, suppose uh, i will see that uh, i'll just give you an example uh, school level physics re to mane padhti ba the difference between uh, velocity and speed What is the difference between velocity and speed? 
normally the more bohire thai che the velocity is a vector entity and uh, speed is a scalar entity so similarly git said he question the j mood and motivation they are like uh, you know speed and velocity mood is just a state of mind you know tumi jete ho religious symbol ko dekhu jo when you look into a symbol or anything it just gives you know takes you to a state of mind ta mane nahi ki je tumi eta kar diyo direction de dela mu tapar eya karibi seta achieve karibi it doesn't talk about that motivation is something like that you know religion can give you motivation which is which he says is a vector entity and at the same time it can give you the moods moods is just a state of mind mate bahut dukha laguthila i was in extreme pain sei pain mo jai ki nijo ko ban kari ki mu thakuran ka agare kandi deli helpless hai ki jetabe when i was you know looking into the lamp jo dipota jali thila that created a different sort of mood in me mor jo anger thila mate se emiti kahi dele se jo bhitre jo krodh jo ye hatak it lapses out it just evaporates au se jo dipota ko jetabe mu anai ki rahuchi it takes me to a different mood or say mood ta kona that mood is you know for that good day in the extreme uh, state of emotions anger would is peace out tranquility are to mate nahi kona and i started seeing things kina i was it full college you know it is thick college that is what you know the power of these religious symbols in bringing a particular mood in you and motivation is a drive try to achieve something ki mo eta karibi mo seta karibi you know it can also have this uh, it can induce motivation and at the same time it can induce a certain mood in you and that's what it says that the most important uh, function of this religious symbols ame babu ki symbols are actually meaningless but that is not the thing symbols uh, they have their own power and uh, that's what gets is saying that it can trigger a certain mood in you so the peace so you get tranquility ho ki a state of joy ho ko a state of uh, assurance ho ki okay somebody is there to look after me mo pake bhagwan achanti e jo jin sada so it triggers a mood in you if not motivation motivation no hai pare kintu mood got a nischay trigger kari so uh, you know Uh, at this point git is trying to address a particular question that why does human beings need religious symbols religious symbols are need ko na amana ko bhi without symbol he paribo ki and at the same time you will see that uh, there is a kind of a cultural universality everywhere so we society ro kichhi na kichhi religion achi a sab religion re kichhi na kichhi symbol achi it is completely universal there is no you know getting away from that and if you you know look at this symbols uh, symbols are again uh, you know symbols they stand for something else they actually you know talk about something which is uh, not the meaning which is not actually contained in that symbol itself for example traffic light traffic symbols they have a new kind of an orientation suppose red man is stop green man is go the light itself doesn't talk but it stands for something else red man is and again it is culture specific somebody like saucer would say that it culture specific that uh, chinese society they maybe red man is go hai ki sorry stop no hai ki go hai pare or green man is stop hai pare it is how you know the society has created it and uh, that's a uh, kids is trying to say that uh, basically when he says that uh, there is an important need of religion because religion is nothing but a system of symbols he is trying to say that there are three chaotic paradoxes uh, you know uh, that human beings face in their everyday life it is bafflement i'm baffled all the time kon kar bhi kon nahi i'm in a state of sometimes in a state of shock sometimes in a state of surprise but at the same time you know there is suffering both suffering thai life re it could be you know personal pain mental pain physical pain agony the loss of uh, you know losing somebody the personal loss and there are certain ethical paradoxes also ki mujhe theek kali ke bhul kali ଯଦି ଗୋଟେ କେବେ ଗୋଟେ ଲାଗିଥିବ କି ଯେ ହଁ ଗୋଟେ କରିଦେଇଛି ଗୋଟେ ଭୁଲ 
माय कॉन्साइंस विल स्टार्ट हर्टिंग मी देखो से जो एथिकल क्वेश्चंस था वो एथिक्स ताहर के मीति वो व्रत का एथिकल वैल्यूज को नहीं कि मुझे आओ जी इट इज आल्सो इंपॉर्टेंट हियर सो गिट्स वुड से दैट यू नो रिलीजियन प्लेज एन इंपॉर्टेंट रोल इन एड्रेसिंग दिस एथिकल वैल्यूज इन मी कि वोटा ठीक की वोटा भूल एंड एट द सेम टाइम मैंने जितने उनके ह्यूमन सफरिंग था सपोज मैं के ट्राइब वोटे सोसाइटी ने व्हेन आई से कि अच्छा मो संगे एमते काई हैला सपोज मते ए रोबोटा हैला मो संगे काई हैला मो कोन भूल कर दिली आ मो जति कि दूर माने पके पर छी यू नो माय फ्रेंड्स माने एते किछ खराब काम कर छंती एमते कर छंती दे आर स्टिल हैविंग अ गुड लाइफ एंड व्हाई इज इट दैट यू नो आई हैव टू हैव हैव दिस काइंड ऑफ अ सफरिंग मो तो केबे सेमती किछ का को हर्ट करे नै बे जानि कि मो लाइफ रे केबे किछ रॉन्ग डूइंग साने नै व्हाई इट हैपन टू मी व्हाई मी एंड व्हाई नॉट समबडी एल्स सो यू नो जित ने गेट्स टू कम दिस स्टडीज इन दिस जापानीज सोसाइटी ही सेड दैट यू नो देयर आर सर्टेन बिलीव्स व्हिच आर यू नो यूज्ड सर्टेन थ्योरीज व्हिच आर यूज्ड अगेन एंड अगेन टू एक्सप्लेन दिस सिचुएशन दिस सिचुएशंस मे बी हमको वियर्ड लगे पारे ओके What a weird kind of a thing it is, and at the same time you will see that uh, you know you will always believe that uh, you know when you talk about this uh, religious suffering, uh, all religions will say that sufferings cannot be avoided. जे there are again things कि ताहले जब इस suffering मूवी suffer करी भी, सीए की suffer करी भी, ताहले वो कहीं की honest है भी. करप्शन आराम से ऑनेस्टी माने एवरी रिलीजन विल टू यू नो मैनेज दैट काइंड ऑफ डिसोनेंस इन यू कि ना ना गॉड जो को पीपल सफर सफर पूर्व जन्म and mujhe thoda kahe ki kuch aur jo life pe kuch tak bade bade meaningless lage is tak pertinent questions tha jo tak thoda rational point of view ro but mane but logical point of view you will not find an answer and uh, in those uh, critical hours religion actually gives you those exams gives certain answers to those basic existential questions as to you know as to why i have to suffer or what is uh, you know the reason behind my suffering so there are certain uh, what you say a, a, a basic framework and religion re, religious belief re jo answer search you may find it strange you may find it illogical but for everything there is an answer say answer tum apna mane aap kothi pai be so perhaps that is the reason why you know for in every society people uh, tend to follow certain religion and religion is such an uh, what you say is universal institution it is find in every society be it an elementary tribal society or a modern kind of a society which is too very advanced in science and technology but there are certain questions that science and technology cannot answer and religion can that's what you know grids is trying to say that those existential questions that uh, we are uh, baffled with often and when there is suffering all around and we also have certain ethical issues to be managed this is where religion actually makes an entry and at the same time uh, you know he says that uh, why is it that we tend to believe in religion ama munda bitare ki eta posela che religion is important and we all need to have a religion can i live without the religion what it has to be is it possible to live without a religion you know normally we say that uh, for example marxism karl marx uh, doesn't believe in religion and he said that religion is the opium of the masses and uh, that's the reason uh, marxists they don't believe in god they don't believe in they don't have religious institutions but at the same time they will find an answer to their problems and for everything they will you know uh, they will uh, replace uh, god with karl marx then so we need uh, what you say an outline a guide in at every moment of life 
so for that we need a particular guideline we need a particular uh, what do you say uh, framework so that we can actually you know give answer to the universal questions in a satisfactory way and this is why this is where actually religion plays a role and uh, this and uh, you know kids would mostly say that uh, people tend to believe in religion it's a matter of uh, socialization the way you have been socialized you will see that uh, जो घर मान बेसी पूजा पाठ कर religion is all about and uh, you will see that uh, you know if you look at uh, certain uh, what you say so then uh, existence of uh, you know of uh, certain tribal religion you will see that uh, certain kind of authority lies in those uh, traditional imageries and there is you know there is a supernatural experience that they believe in there is a experience of oneness and uh, there is an extraordinary personality jo ta ki weber koi tha and jo ta charismatic personality se ka sabra ke religious guru rahe tha so there is a religious perspective to things you know it's a way of seeing things and this religious perspective is actually different from other perspective you can be kahi ki je suppose uh, there are certain questions Certain questions as to I would say ki uh, why certain people are poor and why some people are not not poor. I will ask you to analyze this question. What will be your answer? If anyone can take this question, is acha kichhi lagu kain gori bo thanti or kichhi lagu kain thani thani. What would be your answer? Anyone? No, I just want you to take this question. Jaha bhi mana re asuchi. Just, just try to make an attempt because I just want to point out how a religious interpretation or a perspective varies from other perspectives. Okay, nobody wants to take up this question. Okay, so I will say, suppose, uh, okay, I will stick to this question as to why people are poor. What other explanation hai pare? uh some would say that you know loko kahin gari bathanti na maybe because uh, poor people are not very intelligent and se mane save kari paranti ni saving skills ta kor na thai as the middle class have ki the upper class have then you know, it's a problem because uh, you know se mane kor intelligence level thing iq kam ta kor eta kam so i will try to give a answer to it so that that could be what you say a common sensical answer and gets is trying to say that there are different explanations what a religious explanation of thai paribo what a common sensical explanation thai paribo what a scientific explanation thai paribo it about a common sensical explanation really what a scientific explanation kon hai pare kenti ke karl marx kahile ki je poverty kon tumhe to kehi to ma petaru jami badi dhari ki asina thile it was uh, you know the sources were same everywhere ke ko resource nahi parla ke nela ni ke ko ta ko nela there is an inequal distribution of resources because of this inequal distribution of resources there is inequality in the society there is poverty is the reason which uh, the re hello. reason ha s s s madam yeah hello Hi. yes madam yes. actually uh, If if you want to explain uh, in the religious factor, hmm. okay, madam. Hmm. Yeah. Suppose uh, someone is belongs to in Brahmin family. Okay. Uh, hmm. His or uh, his duty is to worship God. Hmm. If he did, uh, does not do any work, he hmm. may be poor. Yeah. Traditionally. Hmm. Yeah. Very Understood. good. Understood. Hmm. Yes. Ah, uh, this is the first reason. If you uh, 
think yeah. traditionally religious mm-hmm. religious sector is more responsible for poor and rich mm-hmm. it can be for indian yeah i am not talking about uh, religious factor i am talking about religious as a perspective the same explanation can be used as religion for a perspective uh, it may yeah. be used na okay, yeah okay. it can be used yeah uh-huh. so here when i am trying to say that uh, you know uh, there is a scientific explanation to it there is a common sensical explanation to it and at the same time there is a religious explanation to it when i am talking about suppose poverty here madam gave a good example suppose in this context i would say ki you know this there is a karmic theory to that purva uh, janmara you know poor people they have the curse of the previous lives purva janmara ki chhot se bidhai thi but there can be a religious explanation this can also be a religious explanation so there are different ways of looking at things so the religious perspective uh, it may not be scientific it may not be common sensical again when i talk about common sense uh, one has to be you know very careful because uh, one of the major uh, aims of sociology as a discipline is to keep common sense at bay common sense uh, uh, you know normally we have been taught right from the very beginning from our childhood that common sense is not very common but if at all we talk about research we have to put common sense away because there is a common sensical explanation to everything and it is very dangerous for sociology as a discipline because uh, mostly you will look into a taken for granted world जदि आम गोटे न्यूक्लियर सैंस विषय में कह वेरी लेस पीपल क्यान एक्चुअली पार्टिसिपेट इन दैट डिस्कशन बिकॉज सिंस वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट सोसाइटी एंड एवरीबॉडी हैज एन एक्सप्लेनेशन फॉर द इवेंट्स और फिनोमेना दैट इज टेकिंग प्लेस इट इज सो वेरी यू नो टेकिंग फॉर ग्रांटेड नॉलेज देर इज अ चांस दैट इज कॉमन सेंसिकल एक्सप्लेनेशन परस्पेक्टिव शुड री यू नो री इमर्ज अगेन एंड अगेन सो एज द ड्यूटी ऑफ द सोशियोलॉजिस्ट वुड be to keep this common sensical perspective away we have to stick to the scientific principles and this is how you know gets is trying to talk about different kinds of uh, perspective whenever we are talking about uh, you know uh, a- a- any f- phenomena or any event and there is a religious perspective and uh, he believes that uh, this perspective is very important for the believers the non believers may shrug it off and try to you know say that it's an unscientific or uh, it, it's a thing of the past or it's a, it's it's a kind of belief system which is irrational but for a believer you know this kind of a perspective actually saves his or her world and uh, there is another aspect of uh, religion that gets is trying to talk about that is through ritual performance why do okay you know when i say that uh, we need religion in our life is it important uh, to have rituals mu puja ta kala bolu ko ago phulo debi ghanti bajai bi ki mu pani chadhai ki bhog ta chadhai bi why do i need to these to these things so okay i believe that uh, always we need certain support we need certain guideline in our lives and that is where you know the role of religion creeps in but if at all i am talking about rituals how is ritual justified in one's life and we have always you know despised rituals because ritualistic hele life re bahut asubidha hue ye hue and we tend to be more and more non ritualistic that's what you know we have been preaching all these days so what was the role of rituals at the very first place that is what you know grits is trying to say and he says that uh, more or less you know rituals when they perform they have actually certain roles to play and when i'm talking about the roles of these rituals you will see that uh, uh, you know rituals uh, they, they you know they conform they try to they tend to conform your faith in religion you know they reinforce your faith in religion every time you perform a ritual because ritual is nothing but it's you know it's it's again an interplay of the symbols uh, that religion has woven into your world and at the same time it's it's trying to give meaning meaning to the world views that you have taken up and uh, they also generate the kind of ideas that uh, we always believe that you know when i follow this religion ki when i you know worship this particular kind of god it, he or she the god gives me a direction in life 
मते एमिति थिला अवस्था तापरे मते लागला मते बाबा मते रास्ता ता देखैले से जो रास्ता ता मते देखौ छथि सेटा थ्रू रिचुअल्स जेनेरेट हुए बोली बहुत लोक भाबंती एंड गिड्स कुड ऑब्जर्व दैट 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 somewhere you know the role of rituals become important in a religious life because had that been the thing religion would have been just a body of knowledge or you know it would have been syn synonymous to spirituality but here we are not talking about spirituality it is how you know in everyday life how religion is actually you know it plays its role and it's uh, it's uh, enacted it's performed and it is the performativity of uh, uh religion comes through rituals that was a uh, you know the take of uh, gids uh, about religion uh now i would uh, talk about uh, you want to uh, you have any doubts uh, on gids uh, entire uh, synthesis gids ideas on religion if you have any you can just point me out right now we will try to have a discussion if not i will move into uh, the next section that is uh, because we are also running out of time i just uh, we be talking about levi strauss so uh, levi strauss uh, so i guess i i get i guess you don't have any questions now uh levi strauss uh, you will see that uh, basically he was a structuralist he was considered to be a structural anthropologist and uh, anybody uh, can can you tell me what is structuralism about what could be the you know basic uh, thesis of structuralism no let me just continue uh, you will see that no, yeah. you are asking structuralism yeah yes okay i i guess uh, some uh, the in, when in society there are many institutions and mm -hmm. uh, the institutions uh, there are uh, people in the in the institutions they play different roles and mm -hmm. over a period of time these roles get institutionalized further and uh, i think that structure gets created is it very very okay that's about structure so you know the uh, yeah anything else you want to add Okay. no ma'am thank you thank you so basically he, basically he, he was trying to say that how structures are created and how you know the institutions uh, you know get uh, metamorphosized to become structures of the society and uh, you know levi strauss is considered to be a structuralist because somewhere you know he was trying to look into certain uh, deep uh, innate uh, invisible uh, structures of the society if you if you just try to make a comparison between uh, say zoology and uh, you know the structures of the society you will find some semblances uh, i'll tell you suppose uh, you know if you look at landscape somewhere you will find mountains somewhere you will find valleys somewhere you will find the uh, rivers you know a geologist can answer it better they believe that you know there are certain underlying structures of the earth earth ra bhitar structure ta jemiti hei thibo se upar ta se sei anusare managed hobo jodi kothi kothe volcanic uh, uh, outlet achi then se jodi mountains create hei jibo ta mane ta bhitare bahut molten material achi ta bhitar structure ta determine karuchu upar structure ta kemiti hobo so similarly you know if you look at uh, the structuralist perspective structuralism also believes that uh, you know it's the deep underlying uh, things uh, within that uh, you know creates the external manifested structures and uh, if you look at levi strauss levi strauss was actually even it's not only just in sociology if you take up the views of uh, sigmund freud for example Sigmund Freud also talks about you know the conscious, the subconscious, uh, and the unconscious, and he says you know it is basically the unconscious is actually the underlying structure within. So all your fear, your anxiety, your personality, everything is hooked up within that unconscious. So structuralism is actually an interplay of uh, the structures 
and as you said that it's up nothing but the practices the practices that get crystallized so that that crystallizes into a structure which after some period of time becomes very difficult to change because it works as a permanent you know structure of the society and uh, if you look at uh, the work of uh, levis strauss levis strauss was actually you know uh, popular for his uh, study on kinship system and which was uh, known as alliance theory because alliance in french means marriage and uh, he actually talked about exchange of you know women because basically when you are talking about kinship system it is nothing but you know the very act of women moving out of one household to another and that is why he says you know there is it is because of uh, these kind of relationship between two groups that a kind of kinship system is maintained so basically you know he is trying to give a very you know reduce this entire system to a, a structuralist analysis and one of the important uh, proponents of structuralism is the interplay of binary opposites that you will see in uh, all the uh, it is reflected in all the works of uh, levis strauss interplay of binary for example you know when you say that uh, the role of opposites we cannot have an experience of uh, the day unless we realize what the night is like jodi ravana na thanta hue to ame ram ko jani na thante you know the binary opposite side the actually the good the good becomes good when there is the presence of evil je evil ta ette kharab je good ta sete sete ki bol lagila so you will find that reflection uh, all through in levistros uh, levistros's work and basically his uh, works on the cooked and the raw uh, in the savage mind he is actually talking about uh, this uh, interplay of structures and uh, uh you know uh, whenever we tend to talk about uh, levis strauss uh, there, there was one and basically levis strauss on religion we actually tend to think of uh, his work on totemism and uh, totemism this concept i believe is uh, not new to you because you already have you know you have uh, read it in uh, turkim and there are so many scholars there are so many you know thinkers who have talked about totemism and uh, his uh, work on totemism uh, it was a uh, important because uh, i'll just try to say it that you know if you talk about this entire institution of totemism it is basically seen in uh, tribal societies even among one of the society review we have this signs this totems in our lives the basic idea is that the members of a particular clan they consider themselves to have descended from a particular plant or a particular tree or an inanimate ki animate object jemti ki apan mane dekhi dibe mana basa gurubar re mana jota thai apan mane koye re that can be a totem for us so it an animate object hai pare inanimate object hai pare but when we tend to say ki gote anim gote animate object gote plant ru ki gote animal ru gote totem ru ame emerge karche gote particular plant ki ma group they tend to refrain from killing or eating that particular plant or animal and um, they may not sacrifice it or you know there are certain taboos certain restrictions that is associated with totem so basically he says he did not believe that certain thing like totemism ever existed you know he was not trying to answer ki acha what is this totemism you know how it emerged or anything he was basically was trying to see that how this totemic phenomena is uh, actually you know taken into account and uh, how to study the phenomena that you know that happened to be totemic that was his concern and uh he was rather less interested in you know what is the substance of totemism or what contains in totemism he was basically you know he was trying to look at that totemism as a phenomena and uh, how are this totemic phenomena arranged you know you know from time to time how you know it's interpreted and reinterpreted so these were his uh, basic concerns and firstly you know he rejected some of the 
popular thesis that was taken up by anthropologist of those times uh, be boas or ruby or roiber and uh, he believed that it's you know platonism is not an entity in itself it's not a reality so in Durkhi, Dur, you know, Durkhimian term, he would say that totemism is not sui generis. In other words, it doesn't have its own existence, it will not have its own laws. Rather, it is a product. It is a product of, you know, the lives that these primitives, the way they have lived out, they try to identify each other, how the, you know, the social groups formation took place in those times. Yeah, group formation ke mithi hithi ko. See, a group ko belong kare, ye se a group ko belong kare, kota ke animal group, kota ke plant group. Present day society review, we have these kind of totems. So, that's what, you know, Levi Strauss is, uh, you know, find certain explanation to these kind of phenomena. And he actually criticizes the functional views of totemism as well. For example, what does Durkheim say? Durkheim says that, you know, totemism is something that, you know, in the context of religion, Durkheim says that it creates solidarity. It creates a kind of a community which, uh, you know, which binds its members together. And uh, that's, that's what he says, that when he talks about the church, church even, you know, this idea of uh, moral binding, you know, a moral community that keeps its members binding, it's reflected in every aspect of Durkheim's work, be it his studies on suicide or religion or, you know, his methods, you'll find it everywhere. So, uh, you know, and when you talk about uh, Malinowski and his study on uh, those Tropian Islanders, uh, uh, that, you know, you will see that they also have totems and uh, they believe that uh, the totem has certain utilitarian values. So, you know, Malinowski gives an explanation in terms of utilitarianism. But, uh, you know, he would say that, you know, there are totems which are not utilitarian. And at the same time, it is, uh, you know, valued in a particular time, kind of society. And Durkheim's, uh, when Durkheim is trying to talk about social solidarity in a particular society, uh, Levi-Strauss is trying to challenge that, saying that, you know, what about uh, societies with uh, religious pluralism? You know, when a single religion doesn't bring them together. So how do you explain those kind of societies? So that is how, you know, he started uh, talking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, a different uh, uh, narrative on this entire belief and practices of protemism. And at the same time, uh, he said that it's just a product of human mind. And uh, he tries to, uh, you know, define this phenomena and try to make a relationship between uh, one or two, you know, the on a person or object and he was trying to what you say uh, evaluate this entire uh, phenomena by trying to you know create a complete structure so that you know it would be uh, intelligible to human minds and remember these concepts have been drawn from the primitive minds and it is he was actually trying to understand how the primitive mind works and uh, that's why he says that you know he says that when you are talking about totemism, totemism actually falls into two series. One is natural series and other is the cultural series. And a relationship that is established between this natural series and the cultural series. And remember when he is talking about the nature and the culture, there is again, as I told you earlier, that structuralism is based on certain uh, dichotomies, certain uh, uh, binary opposites and uh, here Levi-Strauss when he is pointing out on these two series that is natural natural because it uh, involves plants and animals and that is associated and tra tries to create some certain association with human groups it is about you know certain uh, the it is about the relationship that is uh, uh, constructed between nature and culture and that's how he says that, you know, uh, the problem of totemism arises because there are two separate chains of experience. We are talking about the nature and we are talking about the culture. And that's how he says that, you know, uh, these two experiences, uh, they can be overlapping. And at the same time, the entire, uh, you know, 
the myriad patterns we say it has been created from this nature versus uh, culture phenomenon and uh, let us talk uh, you know, at the same time uh, says that uh, the example uh, you know he is trying to give uh, the example of the first australian protemism that uh, you know uh, that is that, that where he is trying to you know establish uh, a relationship between certain natural and cultural groups and uh, he believes that uh, you know the same kind of phenomena you will find it elsewhere also and um, the way you know a kind of a totem is actually associated with a particular kind of a human group it actually gives rise to myriads uh, cultural uh, you know practices and uh, again when he stopped trying to you know make an analysis of totemism uh, uh, he first first he tries to go through the words of uh, quotes of uh, richard and uh, who who actually has given uh, you know the theory of totemism then rattle brown and uh, you know in this entire process he is trying to explain the very contained and forms of uh, this uh, entire theoretical framework and uh, he is again uh, you know if you look at uh, people like brown or malinowski or take for example for fourth or fourth you will see that uh, they are trying to again uh, you know think of the relationship between the totemic system and the natural species and it is based on a certain perception of resemblance kich ke resemblance rahi chi because you know से माने मे बी दैट ग्रुप से माने एटा को रिजम्बल कर ट्रेट गुड़ाक एमतीिया सो मान दे आर भेरी फिर्स और दे आर भेरी व्हाट यू से एक्टिव कि अलर्ट तेणु टाइगर टोटेम हो पाए किए इट इज बेसिकली यू नो स्ट्रक्चरालीजम सब गोटे मनीष हाउ डज प्रिमेटिव मैन थिंग हाउ द प्रिमेटिव मैन एक्चुअली आक्ट इन एन एनवरमेंट से तार आख पाखे जहाँ देखे सिस्टमैटिक सोशल ऑर्डर क्रिएट टोटेमिज्म इज एन एग्जांपल ऑफ दैट एक्चुअली एंड बेस्ड ऑन दिस प्रीवियस थ्योरीज रेडक्लिक ब्राउन इज ट्राइंग टू से दैट यू नो टोटेमिज्म का किछ ये ता न खाई पारे माने एज सच टोटेमिज्म कोन का फंक्शन कोन इट मे नॉट इंटरेस्ट मी बट द थिंग इज दैट how this phenomena of uh, you know this totemic phenomena the way it uh, creates groups and the way it uh, you know goes on from one society to another that is actually of uh, importance and uh, that's why he says that you know uh, totemism is can actually be a mode of classification in a in a primitive society when you don't have a system of classification totemism provides you that idiom to classify uh, the society and uh, it actually is a means of thinking and it's uh, not governed by any kind of uh, you know it's highly simplistic so that the primitive mind can pick it up and can associate things very easily and uh, basically uh, the functions that totemism fulfills are cognitive and intellectual because that is how an intellectual mind works in a primitive era primitive era re to se mane there was no other intellectual activity so this was was actually you know a kind of function that uh, you know they could carry out in the primitive era and uh, that's why he you know he points out that totems are not good to eat totems ke khan thi nahi they are good to think so it's it's food for thought what we say and the problem of totemism disappears when we realize that all humans at all points of time are concerned with one or other mode of classification and these classifications uh, you know they can operate uh, in many ways uh, in terms of differentiation in terms of opposition or substitution and uh, there is a you know general norm to that and uh, Uh, to illustrate this you know he is giving an example where he says that he says that suppose a society has three clans say there is this uh, this example uh, lestros has given he says that bear is a clan which means land eagle is a clan 
which means sky and turtle is its clan which means water and because of demographic changes the bear clan becomes extinct but the turtle clan you know enlarges and in the course of time it splits into two so society faces you know faces this change in two ways first the same totemic association might be preserved in a damaged form so that the only you know symbolic uh, relation between the sky and the turtle exists second new creature relation will be generated because you know there is a third category of group has started coming has started to come up so this is how you know totems they get created they get bifurcate they may you know combine together so this is a process and whenever you know you try to tend to think of think of any change in any kind of society you will see it in terms of certain totems so uh, that was about uh, levistros uh, view on uh, totemism basically which was uh, this was based on uh, structuralism uh, any questions any discussions or shall i move to, to the next uh, because you know uh, this time uh, i have to actually complete four units in a class uh, because the classes given to me is quite less so i was a uh, bit concerned about that uh, so uh, if there isn't any i'll take up the next unit that is on uh, you know different uh, forms of uh, religion that is your uh, and uh, today we will be talking about uh, different religious communities and we will be talking about the sikh community and uh, you all know that uh, you know sikhs they constitute they, they, they are not one of the uh, you know, most populous religious community in india but they had their origin in india and we always associate uh, the teachings of uh, guru nanak ji uh, you know with uh, the origin of uh, sikhism and uh, sikh religion as such it has uh, gone through many critical phases and you will see that uh, uh, sikhism uh, when you talk about this religion it's uh, normally you know we tend to associate it with the state of punjab but uh, i had your diaspora study classes with you and today if you talk about sikhism uh, no doubt india was the place of its origin but you will find it all over the world you will find the majority of the six in european countries canada usa australia they are all over so it's not just you know that 2% in india that constitutes only the percentage of sikh they have an international community a religious community and uh, india could be the place of its origin but uh, today when let's not uh, restrict the sikhs only to india you know they have a very diverse base today and uh, if you look at uh, you know the relations between uh, the state of punjab and sikh it's uh, intimate because mostly these sikhs they speak punjabi punjabi is their mother tongue and uh, when you talk about uh, you know the, the religious uh, teachings it comes from the gurus and uh, the sacred uh, text is called guru granth sahib and there is uh, also the religious teachings they are drawn from the akal tat and uh, you know the appearance of a sikh i i don't have to go into it because apart from you know the turban uh, there is this kada the the 5k that normally we associate a sikh with so uh, you know uh, leod macleod actually defined uh, he says that, that uh, uh, you know he has a uh, dealt with uh, the, this uh, question of sikhism and uh, he says that sikhism can be defined as the fatherhood of god and brotherhood of man because this is a kind of a religion that is you know that appears masculine you know yeah that is that it will not be wrong to say that every religion is gender jitable when we talk about the shakti cult shakti cult comes with you know ma durga or it's it's a feminine It's a feminine image of religion. When you talk about similarly, when you talk about Sikhism, it it springs uh, an idea of masculinity. It's completely a masculine. So that's the reason you know MacLeod is trying to say that that's the fatherhood of God. And uh, you know when you talk about uh, the teachings of Sikhism, we tend to you know associate them 
with the first guru uh, guru nanak dev teaching and uh, he has actually uh, provided a guideline for individual and corporate life for individual he says that uh, uh, you know one needs to achieve a uh, union with god the wahi guru through meditation and uh, one should read the sacred scriptures reflect on the doctrines in every day's life and you know six all six uh, uh, they should view all men as brothers without you know looking into the issues of caste race and uh, you know without any expectation of reward they should serve others and uh, you know live a life of an ordinary person and uh, to you know have uh, the notions of untouchability magic idol worship superstitions uh, you know these are not uh, you know very you know, not accepted in uh, in the teachings of guru nanak dev and uh, for the corporate life you know it was believed that the six would maintain a, a code of conduct and uh, they should accept uh, the part of the community the part that has been given by the gurus to serve uh, the community with all devotion and uh, at the same time they should proclaim the gurus teachings to the world they should pass it on they should accept the affection of uh, the nanak panthis you know those who have actually taken up the parts of nanak and uh, you know and they should, their hearts should be filled with uh, sympathy respect and love for others and uh, they should observe you know in this uh, ritual should be observed in gurudwaras and other shrines and uh, you know there has been uh, you know additional views like uh, naam japo kriya karo van japo these are some of you know the divine uh, uh, tasks that are uh, inculcated in sikhism and if you uh, look at uh, the gurus uh, Nanak Dev uh, was uh, the first guru who appeared uh, during 1469 to 1539, and Guru Gobind Singh, he was the tenth guru, and he appeared from 1666 to 1708. And if you look at uh, the tradition of Sikh gurus from Guru Nanak Dev and the scholars, uh, you know, who are trying to you know, study Sikhism, they found that you know. nanak guru nanak's uh, teachings where you know they found uh, they formed the base of this uh, this religion of sikhism and uh, uh, if you uh, look at uh, the ideas thoughts and actions of uh, guru nanak ji it was uh, meant uh, to promote sikhism and uh, in the due course of promoting sikh religion guru nanak uh, you know toured several places met variety of scholars and some other religions and he actually you know he in his intellectual journey he could actually meet a number of people from different backgrounds and he could visit places and uh, that could be the one of the reasons why you know you find this uh, you know this uh, as 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 we have already seen in our diaspora paper that uh, the migrating trade uh, genes are there among the sikh because you know the, just remember it was during the 15th century he could travel places to in order to spread sikhism and uh, if you uh, talk about uh, guru nanak ji you can see that uh, you know uh, some there were some significant people who knew him and they had their own ways and they have uh, you know conveyed uh, us about his life uh, through the contributions they are known as jannam sakhis in the sikh tradition and uh, and uh, nanak ji's life has at least you know such jannam sakhis that are available and uh, they are uh, they are called the bhai gurdas puratan jannam sakhis and mihar bahan janam sakhis so you know you will see that uh, you know according to the 
description available in the sakhi we will see that he visited several religious places on his festive occasions i mean he could visit uh, mount sumeru makka medina baghdad i mean he was not uh, you know deterrent to any kind of place uh, that uh, you know it's something that may not be approachable he could you know he could meet people of different race different religion and uh, different ethnicity and uh, there were instances of some uh, you know debates that uh, uh, took place between nanakji and other religious uh, leaders and in one such discourses he pointed out that hindus and muslims when they refer to ram and rahim respectively they actually mean one and the same so it was basically you know a kind of a cohesive religion that was trying to bring unity among different clans and if you look at uh, the origin of or if you critically try to examine the uh, sikh tradition you will find syncretic traditions of both hinduism and islam islam in sikhism and that's the reason you know you will find such discourses in the uh, what you say in the uh, speeches of nanak dev and uh, looking back uh, into Uh, Nanak Dev, you will see that this person uh, was uh, inclined towards spirituality even at the age of five. And uh, seeing this phenomena in action, you know, Hindus thought that he is perhaps an incarnation of God in human form, and Muslims thought him that he is also a true follower. So basically, when I say that Sikhism uh, is a syncretic tradition of both Hinduism and Islam, the reason is that you know, basically. During those days when Nanak Ji was born, uh, you will see that uh, there were two only two dominant religion that was found in India that was Islam and Hinduism, and both of them thought that they are he is an incarnation of their own gods. So you know, of late uh, later on his parents got him married, but you know he started showing. with drug tendency he never showed much interest in worldly activities and he was invited by nawab daulat khan of sultanpur who was very impressed by him and uh, he was you know given the status of messenger of god for the divine court and and that's why you know uh, he was given a cup of nectar that was that is called amrit with a command to drink it with my name now and he did it and returned to the world to fetch the divine name so that is why you know we still have this kind of tradition in sikhism where amrit is given and those people are you know those persons are uh, supposed to be you know considered to be the messengers of god and uh, talking about uh, the gurus you will see that you know details are found in this janam sakhis the three janam sakhis that i mentioned earlier and uh, this tradition was uh, actually established by nanak ji and that's the reason uh, we call it nanak pant all gurus up to guru gobind singh were followers of it and nanak panthis uh, are nothing but you know it constitutes a local group uh, of people who actually sing the hymns of uh, the guru hymns and they have their satsangs which are held at dharmshalas and it doesn't have any caste discrimination people from different caste backgrounds can join these satsangs and the punjabi community you know which was otherwise divided along caste lines was seen united by observing these satsangs so that was you know uh, that uh, gave a new dimension to the punjabi community a, a religion that was based on equality and uniformity and you know unity irrespective of ethnicity caste and uh, religion and uh, here we could see that uh, sikh religion uh, was a strong force you know because it displayed displayed unity among various caste and the sa same time you will find that uh, you know on the one hand each one was well aware of his caste identity with the larger punjabi community but uh, at the same time that thing was you know completely uh, it uh, it was uh, not looked into whenever you have uh, these kind of conglomerations 
and the Sikh gurus they visited several places, you know, uh, oh, during the festive occasions. And, uh, and one important name that needs to be mentioned was of Amritsar, where uh, Guru Arjan, the fifth guru, supervised the compiling of the sacred scriptures for the Pan. And it was in the 17th century where Hargobind succeeded his father Arjan as the sixth guru, and he was called Guru Hargobind. And he came across different uh, and different conditions of the society. And it was uh, the period when Sikh Guru had come, uh, you know, out of the earlier environment where gurus were confined to dharmasalas or religious, you know, visits outside. So some significant changes could be seen during this period. And Harbovind symbolically is referred to as uh, uh, referred to two source women referring to spiritual authority and the other referring to the newly achieved temporal power. So on the basis of you know that spiritual authority that is called Miri and the temporal power that is called Miri, a new building known as Akal Tat was erected. And uh, Akal Tat, you know, it faces the Harmandar Sahib, that is the golden temple that you see in Amritsar. You, mostly you might have seen it in the TV or you might have visited it. You will see that it uh, it reflected a transformation within the Sikh Pan. And the scholars like MacLeod, they have referred to this militant tradition uh, to the earlier existing Jat culture. And uh, during the middle years of the 17th century, and it appeared as if the Sikh tradition might return back to its you know, earlier stage of religious glory. But then one important incident happened. Uh, Guru Tegh Bahadur, the ninth guru, he faced a difficult time and he allowed himself to sacrifice his life at the hands of the Mughal rulers. And, uh, you know, he, he and along with his brave men, he could actually rise against the, the tyranny of uh, the Mughal period of those times. And fearing the same fate, you know, some Sikhs, they chose to remain silent. And uh, but the next guru of the six, that was Guru Gobind Singh, came heavily against this, you know, cowardice activity of the six. And uh, he was suggesting that six should not, you know, hide themselves anymore, and uh, you know they have to recognize their strength because that is how why they were they have been born. They have certain purpose in life, and he symbolically suggested the use of still in their hands, and still in the soul of the Pan. So that is how, you know, soul, it uh, became uh, an important uh, part of the Sikh lifestyle after the preaching of say, Guru Gobind Singh. And he also decided to do away with, you know, the earlier experiment of uh, you know, decentralization of power and demanded that everybody needs to, you know, commit himself to this central authority created by the Sikhs and they required to become members of the Khalsa the Khalsa of uh, Guru Gobind Singh and uh, they are they have known to you know discontinue this tradition of appointing Sikh Gurus and he was considered to be the last Guru. In this way Guru Gobind Singh was the 10th and the last Guru. At the beginning of the 19th century you will see Ranjit Singh he conquered Lahore. He became Maharaja of Lahore in 1801 and since then Raj Karega Khalsa prophecy you know uh, Today you have these slogans. It, it became very popular during those times, during the 19th century when Ranjit Singh conquered Lahore. And after the Anglo Sikh War in Punjab that took place in 1849, the conflicts of the Sikhs with Mughals and the Afghans, as well as the Britishes, could be seen all along history. I mean, all of our history you will find these conflicts with Sikhs getting involved in these kind of. Uh, you know, struggling situations. And uh, if we uh, look at, uh, you know, the interaction of Sikhism with other faiths, you will see that uh, uh, throughout history, Sikhism had, uh, you know, intimately interacted with Hinduism and Islam. Uh, there are some other instances also like caste factors, you know, coming in the way of Sikhism. But you will see that Everyone within Sikh religion, they were aware of his or her caste origin. 
and we have also seen that at religious places and you know at the dharma salas uh, the gurus never allowed any discrimination you know, they would be eating together the same food would be put for everyone and the sikh tradition has a typical combination of religion and caste and uh, one such uh, you know combination of sikh religion with jat culture can also be seen even it's noted in various popular writings that there is uh, no dispute however among uh, the scholars that uh, the origin of uh, you know the jats was with that and uh, at the same time you know uh, Kusum Singh has argued that, that uh, Jats brought about the Panchayat system in which five senior members of the community were commanded the supreme power of the village. So, uh, at such, uh, if, if you talk about uh, the Jat six, they have an uh, enormous uh, role. If you talk about the idea of village republic or small republics, because uh, they will easily find the goals. Thank you. So uh, basically, you know, uh, this idea of uh, you know bringing the community together, of having a very democratic life, uh, of uh, you know, of having a community like this, the idea of this uh, small republic, it came with uh, this community, this particular Jat community. So they always valued the, the notions of freedom, equality, and uh, you know, they they tried to keep themselves away from any kind of Brahminical influence of Hinduism because uh, because that was uh, you know famous in uh, quite infamous rather in propagating certain discriminatory practices that Sikhism has always tried to avoid. And then the denigration of Jats by upper caste Hindus did not result in lowering down the position of the Jats in their own eyes because you know they you know started taking up their status to be equivalent with the Brahmins and the Khetriyas. Uh, the Jats were considered uh, they were born as workers and warriors and they never freed the villages. And in case of invasion, uh, they went for a revenge. In case of, you know, if uh, there was any case of molestation of their women, the Jat would uh, never spare them. So the Punjabi Jats were already, you know, uh, known for risk taking. They could fight any odd situation. And the Jat connection with the Sikh community becomes very important. And that's the reason, you know, when we identify Sikhism with militancy, because, you know, if you, in, Last week, when we were trying to cover the diaspora for our paper, you will see that uh, most uh, in mostly the uh, hazardous, uh, you know, industries where you know the the kind of uh, heavy work was needed, they were actually appointing uh, the jats and the people from the Sikh community because uh, they were known as a community who had physical prowess and it was considered to be a militant community and. Uh, it also you will see that uh, Jats are the only caste which is represented in Sikh religion. For example, uh, Ram Bariya Sikhs they represented uh, with the artisan community and it constitutes an important section of the Sikh community. Then coming to their martial background, Sikh community as I told you it has always been a militant community and uh, uh, they have you know fought battles. They have. Uh, particularly, you know, lived as, uh, you know, fight it out uh, invaders. And throughout uh, history, you will find them in certain conflicting situations. They tried several, uh, you know, permutation combinations to fight against the Afghan uh, invaders. And uh, one Afghan invader, Ahmad Sa Abdali, made at least nine invasions. The Sikh sought the help of the rulers of uh, Delhi and Marathas and that was the biggest challenge that uh, the Sikh community had against the Afghans. Even I think uh, the latest, uh, there was this movie by Akshay Kumar, Bollywood movie, I'm just uh, missing out the name. It was again, uh, you know, the Sikh regiment uh, of the 18th century who were completely, you know, without any weapon, but, uh, you know, they were trying to fight out with the Afghans uh, during the colonial times. Uh, I'm just missing out the name of the movie that it is not a very old one, a recent one. Uh, 
Uh, so uh, here you will see, you know, you know the, the, the tradition of uh, being in conflict with the uh, Afghan rulers has always been there, and uh, Afghan rulers they have in fact had several uh, attempts uh, for you know invading the, the Sikh rulers. And when you talk about Maharaja Ranjit Singh, he has uh, actually disappointed uh, their attempts many a times, and it ha this has been discussed, uh, you know, in history uh, that uh, how. Punjab was consolidated into one state and it could be attributed to the leadership of Maharaja Ranjit Singh and he, because he could prevent the Afghans you know, from invading the Punjab region on the other and uh, to fight against the Gurkhas and thus uh, you know, restricting their influence only up to China. So consolidation of Punjab as a province uh, it has, you know, it had so many enemies and the Sikh community always uh, stood tall and it could actually, you know, make things in their favor. And uh, the first uh, Punjabi victory over Afghan, it came around 1813 with the Battle of Adon. So after the Afghans lost power in uh, North India, they, they tried to, you know, push back their territory. And uh, after the consolidation of the Punjabi power under the Maharaja Ranjit Singh, you will see that the relations between uh, them and uh, the emerging British power became quite cordial. But Punjabi leadership, uh, especially, they were always aware of the British power. And the Sikhs, they realized that sooner or later, the British will also try to rule Punjab. And later on, Punjab, you know, British power, uh, later on, the uh, British power, they tried to, you know, annex Punjab and even the tussle started with them. The Britishers, you know, promised the rule of law in the land of Punjab and initiated some development work. And it was during uh, the Sikhoi mutiny of 1857 that the Sikhs uh, took the side of the Britishers as a result of this. And uh, more and more Sikhs were recruited in the army because the British were always aware that, you know, they are a formidable community. If you talk about physical prowess or militancy, they can go to any extent. So they were, you know, always in a position to appease the Sikh community. And that's the reason, you know, they recruited so many into their armies. And during the First World War, the Sikhs actually outnumbered about one-fifth of the total army. As a result of it, the Sikhs to uh, British rulers, uh, the number was, uh, you know, uh, some of them, although in very small numbers, they had an opportunity, you know, to migrate to United States and Canada. And that actually creates, you know, the linkage that that has been there since the First World War. Because uh, uh, the British uh, always, they took the Punjabi community, the, especially the Sikh community. By Punjabi, it has become completely synonymous with the Sikh community. They always had confidence in them. And that is how you have so many Pravasi Bharatiyas in Canada and uh, America to date. So, and the phenomena dates back to the First World War. And even in Australia, I told you that how it was, uh, you know, even during the period of indentured, even prior to that period, uh, they, when gold mines were invented, that the Sikh community were transported so that they can work in the mines because nobody would have so much of physical strength and stamina as the Sikh community would be having. So, that was one of the reasons. And uh, so uh, we just uh, discussed the Sikh community and um, I think I still have some time so that I can move on to the uh, practices of Jainism and Buddhism um, because uh, you know in this section I have to cover a lot and I just have three classes left so I, yeah, I'll, I'll try to take up some parts of uh, the next unit that is unit 16 and you will see that uh, uh, if you talk about uh, the emergence of Buddhism and Jainism uh, in ancient India, it, uh, it, it dates back uh, to the first millennium BC and uh, uh, it was, uh, you know, you will see that, uh, uh, you know, during the 6th century BC, uh, when there was a period of religious turmoil in India, and simple religious life of ancient India was getting complicated. There was this prevalence of uh, this Brahmanical system of, which was getting tyrannical and discriminate, with its discriminatory practices that was based on complicated sacrifices, ceremonies, 
it created certain kind of unrest among the common people because the common man was not able to meet the requirements of the grammatical traditions that was getting so very hegemonic and dominant during the 6th century for the caste system was another you know rigid uh, uh, facet of inequality that was aggravating the society and uh, the brahmins uh, by now they had taken up the status of being the uh, you know highest uh, rung in the society and uh, you know they started uh, preaching the new philosophy of life and death and they started advocating the ways of attaining moksha and how one should be retain one's own karma and at the same time you will see the that uh, all these uh, you know religious uh, you know ritualistic brahmanic schools they were associated with the earliest period of classical hinduism prominent among them were buddhism and jainism which emerged around 800 to 600 bc they denied the you know they did not simply did not accept that the vedas uh, are you know the ultimate uh, uh, text uh, you know that determines the lifestyle of uh, people here in india and uh, they denied the, the ritual significance of caste and gave uh, that uh, you know that the uh, that uh, you know vedas were trying to preach that you know the, the ways in which uh, caste practices needs to be propagated how you know but people from particular sex group have to work so they were actually in complete denial of all these things and uh, if you look at the history of jainism you will see that uh, uh, it uh, originated during the ancient times and mahavir was the 24th and the last tirthankara literary it means code maker and of the current age and tirthankars are also called jinas they are the revealers of jain religion and they were, were the ones who have you know crossed over life streams of rebirths and have set the example that all jains must follow so the Mahavir was actually the son of a uh, Kshatriya uh, chieftain, and he renounced his princely status, and uh, he took up a life of ascetism at the age of thirty. After about a period of twelve years, you know, he suffered the most self-denying hardships until he finally, you know, reached a stage where he started you know, started to teach others, teach others. so there remains no objective document actually when we talk about the beginning of jainism we actually don't have any chronicle uh, documented data because it dates back to the ancient times and the death of mahavir that is the entry into nirvana which was the starting point of traditional jain chronicle it corresponds to 527 to 26 bc however you know some scholars believe that you know it could be one century later and uh, Uh, mahavir uh, you know he perceived him as the last revealer in the sage and uh, he had 11 disciples and his disciples were called gyanadhar ganadharas all of whom were brahmin converts into jainism and all of them they founded the monastic lineages but only two that was indrabhuti gotama and sudarma disciples who survived mahavir and uh, served as uh, you know points of origin for the historical jain monastic community uh this is you know there is there was this uh, movement among this community and the most significant division that is the swetambara means white group and the digambara means uh, they are called sky sky clad or if that is naked it persists even today and the major point of difference between the two concerns is that the question of proper monastic attire whether or not a soul can attain liberation from female body a possibility that the digambaras deny so they are more conservative when you talk about the digambaras these differences were formalized with a series of you know councils that uh, tried to codify the teachings that was written by mahavir during his lifetime and 
it was felt that the teachings uh, that was preserved orally uh, was actually in danger because people were having different interpretations to it and four councils were held between 4th century to 5th century AD and the last one at uh, that was held at Saurashtra now in Gujarat it codified the Swetambara canon which is still in use so the Gambaras they deny the authenticity of this corpus they say that you know, it was a recent uh, uh, creation and uh, it has lost its authenticity but uh, you know they claim to be the authentic uh, uh, inheritors of Mahavir's teaching so that is how the rift uh, between these two groups uh, that, that still continues uh, after Mahavir's time we will see that the Jain uh, community they could uh, you know spread out uh, uh, to all parts uh, Know, to west to south and they claim to enjoy the favors of uh, many rulers you know the king of Magad was one of the patrons uh, the Mora dynasty Chandragupta Mora by 5th century the Digambaras were influential in the Deccan especially in Karnataka then under the Gangas and the Rashtraputas the Jain culture it actually flourished and the Swetambaras especially in Gujarat they were uh, quite famous Ram Chandra served as a minister in the kingdom and he could actually, you know, many sanctuaries were created during those times, the, uh, such as in Mount Abu now in Rajasthan. Then there is, uh, you will see uh, certain, uh, the sect act actually could rise, uh, that is the sect, Sedambara sect, uh, and uh, it, it was uh, during the Mughal period. You know, when uh, during Akbar's time, they could actually have a great influence. And uh, today, you will see that uh, the Jain community never regained its uh, former valor or, you know, glory. Nowadays, the Digambaras that they, that they are established now in mostly Maharashtra, Karnataka, and you will find the Swetambaras in Punjab, Rajasthan, and Gujarat. And in modern times, Swetambaras, uh, they maintain an organization. They have a monastic community. And, uh, you know, both communities devote much uh, time in maintaining these temples and monasteries and, in, you know, in the religious text. And uh, traditionally, you know, the Jains, they are basically the mercantile people and uh, basically they are traders who have actually who can adapt uh, themselves to different environments and societies and that's the reason you will see that many Jains they have actually now overseas Indians they have migrated elsewhere and now uh, you know among the international community among the diaspora not only among the diaspora but among there is an international awareness of Jainism you know they are everywhere now and they are making an attempt to target their religion. And if you talk about their practices, you will see that uh, uh, all uh, Jains are members of the fourfold congregation, that is Sangha, and it is composed of monks, nuns, laymen, and laymen. The same, they, you know, they have this common belief in three ratna, that is the three jewels. Uh, first is right faith, right knowledge, right conduct. And observance of these three jewels, it provides the conditions for attainment of the goal, which is liberation from bondage. And um, you will see that it can be attained uh, by the Jain monk who is free from all bondages, you know, internal or external bondages. You don't have any desires, you don't have any worldly you know, commitments. So there are certain ideal practices that are in force uh, for the um, you know, male members of the religious community and uh, uh, but at the same time, you know, householders are permitted, you know, certain ceremonies such as worship of images, you know, a practice that has, that they have picked up from Hinduism and uh, both lay the monastic followers, they take these brothers, they take this vows and um, that they would stick to the basics of you know Jain ethics and guides as a pious believer and uh, mostly the J monks and the nuns they take actually five uh, brothers that they are that is called Mahabrathas and they 
pledged that they would abstain from injuring life, false speech, taking what is not given, unchastity, appropriation, and the sixth vow consists of abstaining from taking food and drink at night with the aim to avoid injury to insects, which you know might go unnoticed. So that's the reason they don't take anything, they don't eat anything at night. They, you know, they wear that mask-like thing, which goes very common these days with us also. So when you talk about the ordinary monks who live in the company of others, like uh, they benefit from the advice of the superiors and uh, the, this uh, company that is called the Gana is subdivided into smaller units as well. And um, if you look at, uh, you know, the right uh, religious uh, conduct, it is, uh, it has certain uh, codes of conduct that is uh, giving rules for habitation, wandering, begging, for countries and for finances, for everything you have a guideline. The begging tour is also an important aspect of this community and uh, uh, members have no possession and hence it is minutely codified. Begging and fasting must be conducted with great care and confession that is called uh, alochana or repentance. Uh, they are also an essential part of this community life. Then you have listeners and servants, that is uh, Sravakas and uh, Upasakas, uh, the lay believers. Also, they take the five main vows, that is the Mahabrata, and hence uh, they are called Anubratas, lesser vows. They include Ahimsa, that is non violence, Satya, truthfulness, and Dana, that is charity. So, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the practices uh, uh, and the doctrines that it emphasizes on. Uh, individual exertion and uh, you know it considers that the the joints to be inaccessible they have to you know liberate their souls and on the other hand if you look at uh, the joint uh, you know community they have not been able to ignore the devotional aspects that they have picked from Hindu rituals so all these practices are believed to lead the soul to achieve its own perfection. That is called Siddhi. And that is how that becomes one of the major goals of uh, the Jain the practices. Now, talking about uh, uh, the religious uh, goal, uh, you know, eternal liberation. It is non-attachment to any kind of worldly life or Eternal desire is completely, you know, it's something that they actually form completely. And uh, to understand how the joiners perceive and address the problem of impediments towards the liberation of soul is to explain that, uh, explain the joiners' conception of reality actually. And um, today it is, you will see that uh, you know, they have this. Uh, Symbol of will with 12 spokes called aras means ages. Six making an ascending arc where man progresses in knowledge, age, stature, happiness, and six non descending ones where he deteriorates. And the two cycles joined together make one rotation of the two that is called kalpa. Uh, so if you look at the joiners, they have inhabited the universe into five parts. The lower world, that is Adhaloko, it's sub, sub, subdivided into seven tiers, uh, each one darker and torturous. Then the middle one, Madhilo, consists of uh, numerous uh, concentric uh, you know, continents separated by seas. The central continent, that is uh, Jam, Jambudipa, human beings occupied, this, and uh, then uh, the celestial world, that is called the Ur. Udvaloka and it consists of two categories. Uh, the apex of the occupied universe is Siddhasila, the crescent shaped abode of liberated souls, that is Siddhas. The Siddhas go and reside in that heaven that is called the Siddhasila. So uh, these are you know some of the important components of this Jain doctrine. And uh, if you look at uh, you know there are actually five characteristics of uh, the soul that is they call the jiva 
and that is consciousness bliss and uh, energy and uh, you will see that the zebra possesses these qualities in infinite measure and uh, it can be divided into the two embodied states that is mobile and immobile and according to the number of sense organs possessed by the body they inhabit so you know the jains believe that uh, there are four elements and uh, so are also the anim they are animated by the souls so uh, that's the reason you will find that uh, you know they, there is a belief that uh, you know matter furnishes into a soul and it's incorporated into certain corporeal functions and there are these five kind of bodies each having different functions so at least uh, you know they have this uh, karmic uh, body which uh, results from previous uh, action and they believe in the transmigration incarnation of soul and again uh, you know freeing oneself from all kinds of bondage and uh, you know trying to free the body the mind and that that remains very core to the jain doctrine uh, you will see that uh, the process of bondage of liberation it can be uh, summarized uh, into certain categories one is jiva jiva influx of karmic matter into the jiva bondage then stoppage of that karmic influx and expulsion that is nirjara so you know and then comes total liberation so this is these are the uh, you know very processes through which bondage and liberation the passage from bondage to liberation takes place talking about the symbols and certain iconography that exists in uh, this uh, jain religion you will see that uh, you know however uh, you know there are certain descriptions of stupas and pillars tree signs that uh, you know incorporates the jaina text and um, they, they have certain distinctive features the jain shrine is the image of the tirthankara to whom it is dedicated and uh, you will see that uh, you know there are certain auspicious symbolic diagrams like the will the jaina law that represents the jaina jaina law then uh, there are the uh, arhats the siddhas so these are you know certain symbolic forms in which they are represented then uh, you have many jaina temples all around and uh, stupas uh, were among the first monuments that were erected by the jain community and soon you know the buddhists they also started having stupas so you know the origin of stupas that it basically belongs to the jain community and throughout the ages you will find that there has been a, a, what you say the minority they, they have as a minority they have occupied a, a, you know they have always been a minority in india and elsewhere and uh, the spread of jainism it is largely confined to india and uh, it's uh, quite a progressive community and uh, we still have a you know five seven minutes so talking about i'll just give you a brief intro to buddhism you will see that uh, buddhism focus was basically on the teachings of gotam buddha who was born in kapilavastu that is in nepal now and uh, he came you know he appeared around 5th century bc and uh, uh, you know it could spread all over the indian subcontinent in the next 5 centuries central south asia east asia in the next two millennia and it could actually undergo you know certain changes because of missionary diffusions throughout south asian countries and you know it could also win the patronage of certain monarchs and that was the reason it could spread out so easily so if you look at the distinctions between the major historical forms of buddhism it has centered on threefold typology it is based on certain doctrinal and institutional differences which falls uh, into certain you know geographical areas one that is located in southeast asia it is mostly comprising of ceylon burma thailand next is uh, in nepal sikkim china korea and japan region 
and the third is mostly Tibet, Mongolia, and parts of Siberia. So, if you look at uh, you know the first category, that is the Theravada. It has certain canonical literature associated with it, which has institutionalized you know trying to give a order to the monastic life. And on the other hand, the, there is this uh, Mahayana, which is a diffuse and a complex combination of several schools and sects, and it is based on certain heterogeneous literature. And um, the, then uh, there is the, the stigmatized category, which is called the Hinayana. Hina means small, small vehicle. Maha means big. So uh, this is about uh, Tantric Buddhism. It is mostly dominated uh, in Tibetan area. And uh, there you will see that uh, you know the, uh, this Tantric teachings which originated in India it persisted in several uh, so-called Mahayana schools in Japan and China. And in its Tibetan form, Buddhism was richly fused with you know the idea of uh, primitivism that was associated with their own society. So that's how it existed also. Uh, talking about the doctrines of Buddhism, you will see that Buddha literally means the enlightened one and that is how you know we call uh, Siddhartha become Buddha when he became enlightened and he started you know he renounced his worldly life, his kingdom and you know he passed into a state of Nirvana which literally means without any desire. So, you know, a state of uh, being completely desireless. So, the if you look at the major forms of, you know, tradition which is there in Buddhist teaching, you have certain, uh, you know, what you would say, practical yoga which is, which follows some, uh, uh, you know, some middle part between, uh, you know, extreme bodily indulgence and Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. So, students, any questions to ma'am? I haven't yet finished yet. I just uh, need a minute or two to just wind up, sir. Continue, continue. Okay, I'll just wind up in a minute or two because continue, I'm just continue, okay. Continue, continue. Well, I'll just try and take uh, two, three minutes more. So basically what uh, Buddhism trying to teach, it says that, you know, you abstain from all kinds of uh, uh, indulgence, all kinds of, uh, you know, desires. You just negate all kinds of desires and lead a path of intellectualism. And uh, Buddha says that uh, life uh, exists in sorrow and suffering and uh, which is actually caused by desire. So if you put an end to your desire, there will be an end to the sufferings, all kinds of suffering. So basically, you know, he is talking about certain uh, uh, austerities in terms of uh, uh, suffering. He believes that all creatures, uh, they are marked by suffering and they have certain bondage. And uh, the cause of suffering is nothing but desire. And cessation suffering is the cessation of desire. And this is how, you know, he is talking about the Eightfold Path. And uh, the Eightfold Path, it's uh, all about, you know, doing away with all kinds of desire. And uh, uh, Buddha has recommend certain, recommended certain paths which consists of, you know, uh, you know, the right viewpoint, right values. He's talking about right speech, right actions, livelihood, and right efforts. And in the process, uh, you know, he is uh, actually, you know, it's a, it's a it's a community it's a community which uh, it's a basically a community that that goes uh, on spreading and you know they have a routinized and a very disciplined life and uh, they they still maintain it in till uh, till date they maintain that kind of a thing so i think uh, i will wind up today right now and uh, we'll talk about uh, the historical development of buddhism we'll take it up next class and uh, I will take up the next, uh, you know, uh, vlog uh, tomorrow. So, uh, sir, we will be winding up right now. If uh, any participant has any doubt, we can just come up uh, with any of your, any clarification or you want to give any suggestion or you want to have any comments to make, please come up with.
or else we'll just wind up. So, students, any questions to ma'am? Let's speak something. Yeah, you just know, don't should, don't like this. I mean, only spectator. Okay, don't be silent spectator. You should speak something. If any doubt, any clarification. You don't have any doubt? No, sir. Okay, I mean, how do you feel? The class is all right? Yes, sir. The class is all right, sir. Okay, fine. Thank you very much, ma'am, for your nice presentation. So, tomorrow, same day, you will, I will again, you will join. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, you students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's more of a snake. Hmm? It's more of a snake.